2012 deadline, which comes due on June 1st. A lot to be accomplished, uh, or should have been accomplished, and uh, our instructor this morning will be Kay Roundtree. Kay is the owner of the industrial hygiene consulting firm, Industrial Hygiene Sciences. Kay has got over 37 years of experience dealing with this kind of stuff, so I'm sure it'll be very informative to you. And uh, before we begin, I would like to tell you that your phones will be automatically muted as well as your computer's microphones should be muted also, and that'll be done through AFS here. And uh, at the end, there'll be a question and answer session, and you can type the question in the lower sidebar, and Kay will address those questions as they, they come up after she's done. So with that, we'll turn it over to Kay. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. All good. Wonderful. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a gorgeous Friday. Thanks for taking the time to uh, listen in this morning. Um, got a lot of stuff to cover here, so we'll get going. Um, the deadline, the final one, is coming up um, uh, June 1st, and it seems like this has been a long time in the making. The standard uh, has been out and in the process for a long time, and it hardly seems like uh, all this time's flown by, but it has, and we've got some things that uh, you need to make sure you have ready uh, as we go forward here. So I'm just going to give you a super short history of HASCOM, because many of you are probably already familiar with it, but I wanted to just kind of link things together and make sure we're all on the same page this morning. Uh, the first hazard communication standard was in 1983, and then OSHA made a whole bunch of revisions in 1994. Um, the latest revision occurred in 2012 um, to align the hazard communication standard uh, with GHS, and that was the, the, the last big change in the standard. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the nuts and bolts of, of the standard because many of the things did not change. The, a lot of the requirements that OSHA had for your hazard communication programs really didn't change. But what did change uh, was the classification of hazards um, and how that is done. Uh, moving from material safety data sheets to safety data sheets, and of course labeling, which is probably um, the biggest thing that changed um, in HASCOM 2.12. As I uh, talk today, I will be using the, the phrase HASCOM 2.12, or 2012, excuse me, uh, to describe um, things that happened uh, with, the, with the revisions in the hazard communication standard. So I'm not going to go over the first the deadlines because we've already gone past all those. So June 1st, um, uh, your programs need to reflect um, any alternative labeling systems that you might be using. We're going to talk quite a bit about those um, as we go along this morning. Um, and any other aspects of your hazard communication program need to be updated. And this is primarily affecting uh, your written programs to make sure that um, they're in alignment with, uh, with the changes. Uh, and then to provide any additional employee tra training for any newly identified physical or ha health hazards that may have come as your suppliers have, um, have hopefully by now updated their safety data sheets. So, where are we at right now? Just so I give you a little synopsis, my data is a little bit updated, but I doubt that it's changed really a whole lot. But um, took a look at uh, citations that uh, OSHA has issued um, for the hazard communication standards since 2000, between 2012 and 2015, and basically they're the same old, same old things that we've seen for years with hazard communication. Most of you probably know that this is one of OSHA's most cited standards. It's, it, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that they can cite uh, employers on. And what it really amounts to is that um, people didn't get, get, didn't get the first uh, revisions to HASCOM and may, not, may have not even got the original HASCOM. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of that this morning so you can check your programs to make sure that you've got yourself covered there. Um, another issue that is still, in my opinion, an ongoing issue is that lots of manufacturers still haven't prepared uh, their, their 2000, HASCOM 2012 compliant safety data sheets. Um, and uh, we still may see that uh, continuing to be an issue as we move forward. Uh, many of what are called safety data sheets are really not correctly identifying hazards or downstream hazards. I think a lot of people just thought they had to throw pictograms on, a, on their old MSDSs and voila, they'd have an SDS, but that's really not how the process works. 
Um, some of the labels on products are, are not HASCOM uh, 2012 compliant uh, or they're missing. I, I still continue to be amazed in walking around foundries and other employers on items that should have labels on them that do not have labels. Bags of refractory materials are, are a perfect example where um, I do not often see uh, labels, not even, not even the old HASCOM labels. They simply are not there. Uh, many employers still have outdated material safety data sheets, and uh, they're still depending on those. They're not replacing um, their, their MSDSs with SDSs, and this is a problematic area for uh, employers. So just a little bit of summary here um, of, of some of the citations, and I really want to zoom in on what, what tends to get violated or where the, the deficiencies are. And a lot of them have to do with the written program. It's simply missing things or, in some cases, is non-existent. Um, maintaining the safety data sheets and having them accessible has also been another uh, issue, and, and um, the training is a big issue. When I look at a lot of these citations OSHA has been issuing, um, you almost always see the things going hand in hand, written programs inadequate, missing safety data sheets, and lack of training for the employees. So we're going to uh, kind of zoom in on a lot of that today because that seems to be where folks are, are, are missing some things in their programs. Um, there's also been all of these transition issues between the old and the new hazard communication standard. Uh, one of the biggest issues, um, and, and again, I think it's going to continue to be uh, an issue, uh, and as users of chemicals, this really isn't necessarily your problem, but it does have an impact uh, because you're the ones receiving these safety data sheets. But uh, manufacturers were saying they weren't getting GHS compliant safety data sheets from their suppliers. Uh, and they petitioned OSHA to delay in, uh, that last, last June's deadline for having to have their SDSs done. Uh, OSHA says, no can do. We'll give you a little more grace time. That's basically what they, uh, what they did. However, they, they, you still had to supply uh, compliant labels, uh, 1994 compliant labels and MSDSs. I think as we go forward, this is going to become less of an issue. However, again, I still see a lot of non-compliant documents out there. Some other um, transition issues had to do with um, distributors and um, things like that. I'm not going to go into, into all of this. However, uh, it does create problem for you as users because distributors were allowed to continue to distribute uh, stuff they had in stock that was not, um, was not uh, HASCOM 2012 compliant, you know, they're saying, hey, we don't want to have to relabel all these things. And, uh, and in fact, um, OSHA agreed with that. They still had to have 1994 compliant that labels and SDS, but I'm sorry, labels. Um, but um, they were again given a, a little bit of a grace period here. But the, the drop dead deadline uh, for which all containers in the control of a distributor um, to have um, 2012 compliant labels is actually at the end of next year. And this does create some issues for you. If you've trained your employees on recognizing pictograms and all the other things, and yet they're still seeing stuff coming in that is not labeled, I think it does create some confusion in the workplace. Uh, OSHA has tried to supply some more clarity to this. Um, when they issued the standard, they just, as always, issued a standard. But the, um, the way that they're going to enforce it, or really the thought behind things, was kind of missing. Um, since uh, 2012, um, there's been a number of letters of interpretation that have issued that have, have been issued about the standard. They've been rather enlightening. A lot of them have had to do with labels, and I'll include that information as we go along today. Um, they also published their small entity compliance guide for employers, and I have a link on, later on in the presentation to that document. It's it there's there's some good information uh, in there if you're looking for some guidance uh, to improve your hazard communication program. Uh, in 2015, last summer, they, is, they issued their enfor enforcement directive, the CPL. Uh, there is a lot of meat in there, and I've used a lot of that information um, um, basically that explains how they're going to enforce the standard, and there's a lot of um, tidbits in there. Uh, on what they're actually looking for uh, in hazard communication programs. And I've incorporated those to, in today's presentation. And lastly, um, early this year, they issued a document providing info for uh, um, chemical manufacturers and importers who have to prepare SDSs and labels. Uh, that may not affect most of you, um, but that document has provided some additional insight as to their expectations. <clears throat> 
So in their small entity guide, here's what OSHA considers the steps to developing an effective HAZCOM program. And I'm, I'm going to go through these uh, five steps, and if you um, follow along, hopefully you'll uh, be in compliance. Um, and we're, I'm just going to skip through this because we'll deal with these as we go along. So the first step is understanding the hazard communication standard. And I kind of um, focused on, on a few of these areas, you know, what's covered and what's not, because there still seems to be a little bit of confusion as to exactly what chemical substances are included under the standard. Uh, the classification issue, again, for those of you not classifying and having to write documents, uh, this is a little less of the problem, but you see the fruits of that classification on the SDSs and labels. So we're just going to talk real briefly about that. And then, of course, uh, what you're required to do. So if you, um, by understanding the hazard, uh, I'm, excuse me, understanding the, the standard, uh, you'll uh, be able to move forward here. So the scope of the standard, this is addressing this what's covered and what's not. Um, it does cover any hazardous chemical present um, under normal conditions of use and foreseeable emergencies. And I think sometimes that latter one um, gets overlooked if you have sto large storage of, uh, of chemicals um, on site where there could be an emergency. There's an overlap here, obviously, with the Haslopper standard, but um, OSHA does consider um, that you or does does expect that you um, in your hazard communication training do address the issue of foreseeable emergencies and I think the word foreseeable is uh, is spelled wrong obviously there sorry about that foreseeable emergencies you know anything can happen at any time but I, I don't think they're looking for the weird stuff they're looking for things that you can look at and 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 um, deal with things like leaks and spills that sort of thing. It does include um, a number of things that I find get really overlooked in a lot of HASCOM programs. Um, and that includes byproducts, hazards created during use, uh, this whole issue of how do consumer products interface with the standard, and then articles. And we'll talk about a number of these um, so we could hopefully uh, give you a little clarity in what, what, the, what they mean here. There is limited coverage under the standard for laboratories, and I mention this only because a lot of people, a lot of foundries have QC laboratories, SAM labs, other things like that, that, that they consider laboratories. These are not exempt from the hazard communication standard. While um, other laboratories, like academic laboratories or research laboratories, are covered, uh, are, are exempt in part from the standard, your production-related laboratories are not exempt. So you have to treat them just as you do uh, the rest of your processes. Um, operations where you only have sealed containers also have reduced obligations. These would be for warehouses uh, and distributors or, or places that this, the only thing that's happening is a chemical container goes through the, the building. Um, there is no um, actual exposure going on. Uh, there are some requirements, but you can see that they're lesser requirements than for people who are actually handling uh, and exposed to chemicals. So there's a few other exemptions and limited coverage. Uh, exempted from the standard are radiation and biological hazards. Uh, those are covered under um, other parts of um, federal regulations. Um, and then there's the limited coverage. And this is where I think uh, we want to focus a little bit of attention here. Um, in the CPL, they actually came out with, a, I think, a better description of this whole issue of consumer product usage. Um, consumer products are covered under the hazard communication standard if they're used in a manner that's not intended by the manufacturer, uh, I don't know how you'd actually know that, but I think some common sense there would tell you that you might be using it differently. Or if the frequency and duration of use uh, results in exposures that are significantly greater than those experienced by the normal consumer. And I, and I, I put that into italics because that's uh, what OSHA says in their CPL. They're, when they see these exposures to consumer products, and these would be things like, you know, cleaners that you could go buy at Walmart or, or your Home Depot or places like that. You bring them into your workplace and people use them. If the exposures from using those things are significantly greater than the normal consumer, then you are obligated to um, put those chemicals into your hazard communication program. So I think that's a little bit clearer than maybe it was before. Um, some people choose to include all chemicals, whether they're consumer products or not, but this is how OSHA is going to look at it. <coughs> Um, the whole issue of articles that do not release hazardous um, chemicals when used to be classified as an article, the exposure must not pose a risk to the employee's health. 
Um, but the problem with a lot of articles is that during the use, they do produce what are called byproducts or downstream hazards. Um, and these are covered under the hazard communication standard. And I find that these are one of the most overlooked um, parts of the standard. Things that when you purchase them into your facility, they're kind of just sitting there. They're not doing anything. But during processes that you may subject them to, there are hazardous, material, hazardous substances generated. Um, these are supposed to be declared on the safety data sheet in the label. Um, they're often called downstream hazards. In my experience, what I found is that a lot of safety data sheets that are coming from overseas do not clearly uh, list these because um, there's, I think there's some understanding internationally that under GHS we're supposed to look at primarily the intrinsic hazards of the material and not these downstream hazards. But OSHA um, has never taken that approach in any of their versions of hazard communication. Um, and it's very important that you look at stuff that in your use might generate hazardous substances. And I've some, this list over on the other side of the slide are just some examples of things that could generate exposures to hazardous substances during normal or, uh, or I would say expected unusual conditions of use. Uh, and I'd love to, let's take, um, for example, welding rods and wires. The, when you use them, you know you get fume generated from them. Those fumes do have um, hazardous um, or p potential health effects, and so um, they present downstream hazards to the user. So it's really important when we talk about inventories and, and doing training that you include these things that could create um, hazards at, during the use of the product. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times I do an IH survey and nobody's got their SDSs for their welding rods or their wires or some of these other other things where, where you need it. I put plastics on there because uh, it doesn't really apply to foundries very much, but there are chemicals that, uh, as they're heated up, can generate um, some toxic materials, uh, and those have to be um, declared on the safety data sheet and, and, um, uh, and, and put into your HASCOM program. Some of the challenges, and I think I, I've just you know, mentioned this, is that the, the, the SDSs that you receive may not clearly communicate these secondary hazards. So um, if, you, if you're looking at your stuff and going, well, do I have one or not, well, you, you have one choice. You can go back to the manufacturer and ask them if there's secondary hazards and why they haven't put it on their SDS. But the three things that I've kind of listed here are, are, are processes and things that when you do them to, to articles can create um, hazardous material, other hazardous substances. So if you're heating things up to high temperature, there's a pretty good likelihood that you're going to get these secondary hazardous substances coming off. Uh, when you do things that create dust, whether it's abrasive blasting, grinding, uh, any of those sorts of things, you are creating dust and those things can have these hazard, uh, that dust can be hazardous. So those are just a couple of examples of, um, of, of things where you have these secondary hazards. Some other things to know about Hazard Communication 2012, I've already mentioned the classification issue here. Uh, it covers physical and health hazards. It's not your job to classify things. It is the your suppliers who are supposed to be doing that. And they need to be following the specific criteria of the Hazard Communication Standard. And, and as I mentioned before, there's still a lot of um, what I consider improperly classified materials out there, and this will be, continue to be a struggle as we uh, as we go on. It's not your necessarily your problem as a user, um, uh, but it, it does create some some problems um, um, in terms of just knowing about what hazards might be there. The, the safety data sheets have to follow a specific format. Um, everything on the safety data sheet, or a lot of the warnings and and, and use the stuff that that. Um, it's important to you as a user, that information is all based on the classification uh, process that the author goes through um, uh, to, to figure out what to call this stuff. Um, all required sections of the SDS must be completed. So no longer can you just omit sections because they don't apply. It has to say that it's either not applicable or no data. Uh, you just can't leave these things blank anymore. The ship container labels, um, and, and, and you're going to hear me use the word ship container um, a lot through this presentation to distinguish it from in-plant labeling systems. So when OSHA talks about those five elements that have to be on labels, they're really talking about ship container labels. And there's, um, there's 
actually I have six things on there, so it's not five elements. I think the hazard statements and precautionary statements oftentimes go together. But they're, they're, those elements have to be on the, on the ship container label. That, those elements are determined by the classification. So what do employers need to do to comply with the standard? Um, this is, again, step one. And now that we know about the standard, what do you have to do? You have to determine what, what you have on site. You have to do your written program. Uh, do an inventory, communicate with contractors, um, gather the SDSs, ensure that your stuff is labeled, and train employees. And we're going to go through these um, elements uh, here. So step two is preparing and implementing a program. Um, OSHA is big on written programs, as we all know, and it's, they like them because they, they, try, they provide a system, um, systematic way for you to uh, uh, comply with a standard. So the things that I've listed here are what must be in your written program. Um, and I'm not going to go through these right now because we're going to go through these individually here. I'm going to start out with the inventory because really the whole, I think, HASCOM program and what you have to do really follows what, what you have in your inventory. And um, when I go out into a lot of places, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite amazed that if they're, if they're doing their, um, their, uh, their own inventories, in other words, they're not farming that out to a, uh, a third-party vendor, um, it's amazing how many of these inventories haven't been updated in years. Um, I go to look for a chemical and it's just simply not there. And I, I think this has been a, a problem for all of us who have 10 hats that we're wearing, is how do we keep these inventories up to date and meaningful. But OSHA does have the expectation you have an inventory and that it must contain the product identifier. And I think this is a really key thing. Whatever, you are, whatever that chemical is called on the SDS and the label, because those are supposed to be the same, that's the, how you should be identifying these at least someplace on the inventory. So the, the point of the inventory is that it can link up to make sure you have the SDSs and labels. Um, so I think it's really important to have the product identifier be exactly the same that's there. It has to include all chemicals, including all the stuff that has secondary hazards, even if they're even if they're um, not in current use. So, you know, digging into those maintenance uh, closets and and shelving, um, laboratories, all kinds of little nooks and crannies throughout your foundry, you may find stuff um, on your site that is not in your current inventory. So you have two choices: you either need to get it on your inventory, or you need to uh, properly dispose of it. So. If you have it, even if it's not in current use, you still have to have it on your inventory. You can set up your inventory for the whole facility, or you can do it for specific work areas. But again, if you do it for specific work areas, at some point, I think it makes sense to have a, a, a more global um, inventory list. So some of the challenges with these inventories, we've already talked about uh, overlooking covered chemicals a little bit. Um, inconsistent product identifiers. I find that with a lot of um, inventory systems, including um, online management systems, that it's still really hard to find the chemical and there's still stuff missing. Um, you need to decide how you're going to identify that chemical and be consistent with that identification with whatever type of system that you decide to set this up. And you need to demand this from your online management systems as well. Um, I have a client that uses uh, one of those very large online systems, and they have multiple sites, which it makes sense to management. But I have to say that it is very difficult to find documents within there, because who's ever deciding at that management system what to call these things, they are not consistent in what they name that. Part of it is a problem with their supplier who isn't consistent. But I guess my point is that you need to make sure that you, you have a way for people to find these things and for you to find them when you're doing your, your checks to make sure you have everything in the system. Um, <clears throat> if you're trying to organize your list, consider at some point having a, a way to identify it by a common name as well as an actual name. Uh, sometimes people call mixtures, you know, 50-50 or there's, some, there's something within your facility that they call it, which you can't look it up under that name because you're using maybe the, the actual uh, product identifier. It'd be nice to have that, um, that common name somewhere uh, to link to your product. Um, having multiple search options, so you could look at it by department or look at it by, um, by chemical name. 
Um, I find a lot of systems look up things by have it organized by vendor because I think they're linked usually through purchasing departments. Um, but to be honest with you, most employees out on the floor aren't going to have a clue who the vendor or distributor is. So I don't think you know linking it that way makes a whole lot of sense. It may be important uh, to have it there, but having alternative ways to search and find something is much better. Um, the list is not current, and this is something that appears over and over in um, in OSHA CPL. Is their expectation is that you have a current system? So, in your written program as well as in practice, you need to figure out a way of how you're going to edit that list and maintain that list as you get new products in and as new safety data sheets come in, and keep that uh, as current as you possibly can. Let's talk a little bit about non-routine tasks and pipes. OSHA does expect that you address this in your written program. Um, non-routine tasks are those that occur outside of the normal work routine. I, you know, they, they could be stuff that just simply aren't done very often. Maybe they're outside of that particular employee's normal work tasks. Maybe they're deviations um, from the normal way of doing something. Or maybe they've just really never been done before. And I think if you look at your facilities, you can find a lot of those things and a lot of those tasks that involve um, exposure to chemicals, um, whether it's changing bags in the bag house, changing filters, cleaning out sludge things. You know, all of those things, uh, those kind of tasks that just are not um, in the realm of normal production um, are considered non-routine and have to be addressed in your uh, written HASCOM program. Um, they also have the expectation that um, unlabeled our pipes are, they're supposed to include hazards about unlabeled pipes in work areas. Uh, you can label those I st and, and then, you know, I still think it's a good idea to include information on what's in the pipes, what the hazards are, and what might happen if there was a leak or a breach in those systems. So for dealing with non-routine work, I think you know you want to identify in your written program your process for addressing those hazards. So obviously, the first step is figuring out where you have these kind of exposures, uh, preparing written SOPs or whatever you call them, job, uh, job safety analysis or whatever, and doing HASCOM training before each episode. I know that maybe seems like a pain, but people forget things as, with these non-routine tasks. And I think it's important that you do a little refresher uh, of what the potential hazards are here and go over the safety data sheet and protective measures for the employees with this work. Um, you also can have non-routine um, hazards generated by contractors. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but OSHA is very big on, on your interface of your HASCOM program with any contractors that you have that might be either bringing stuff into your place that has hazards or are subjected to, to what you have in your facility for hazards. So, um, identifying a point person in your organization who's going to interface with the contractors uh, to review their work before it starts and identify any chemical hazards that might be present from their work. Uh, and then getting those um, safety data sheets in advance, uh, reviewing them, and then informing your employees. Um, if your employees don't know what's going on and someone is coming into your facility and doing something that's unexpected, it does create a lot of concern and uh, can really be problematic. And, uh, result in calls to OSHA. I've seen that very frequently. So uh, managing those things uh, in advance will really help uh, minimize those kind of problems. Uh, Multi-employer work sites is, is another issue that has to be addressed. Um, and here we're talking again about bringing contractors into your facility who might who might be um, using chemicals or exposed to your chemicals. I'm not going to read all of this other than to say your written program has to address how you're going to do that, how, how you're going to get their stuff, and how they're going to get your stuff. And you need to put that into a process um, for, for how that's going to happen. Um, the expectation, like confined spaces, is that this is a two-way street. Um, you need to inform contractors about your hazards and where they can obtain safety, your safety data sheets. Likewise, they have to inform you of their hazards and that they might be introducing and have their SDSs available for you and your workers. So again, before these folks that do this kind of work come on to your site, you need to be asking them, you know, what are they doing? Um, do you have hazard communication addressed in your contractor safety program? Is there a designated person who's going to kind of uh, interface with the contractors? And where will the contractors' SDSs be stored and accessed? If they're not available to you um, very, very quickly, 
um, that would probably not uh, go over really well with OSHA. I think it's very important that you ask them and actually have physical copies of their safety data sheet so that uh, you know you're in the know there. So the next part of the written program has to address safety data sheets. Um, just because a document says it's a safety data sheet doesn't necessarily mean it's compliant. Again, that's not necessarily your problem other than that if you get safety data sheets coming in and they clearly are not compliant with the standard, I do think you have the obligation to go back to the vendor and say, hey, this is not a compliant document. We expect something better. Uh, same thing with labels. Um, I think if they are not meeting the expectations, they're missing things, I do think you have an obligation to uh, go back to the vendor and dus discuss it with them. Uh, you need to cross-check that inventory list so that you know that you have that SDS uh, current, should be current SDS for every chemical that's on the list. Um, you need to have a plan on what to do about stuff that's brought into uh, your facility, either unplanned or planned, um, and what to do if a safety data sheet isn't received with a new shipment. Um, there's various ways that you can do that, and, and there's there's no right or wrong way. The, the point is that um, you need to figure out how to either hold something in quarantine or simply reject having uh, materials that don't have SDSs um, that accompany it. Now, the vendors vendors are only obligated to send you a, a safety data sheet upon initial shipment. So maybe that document got lost somewhere along the line and 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 is is um, not in your system. Um, but even with that, you have to have that safe, safety data sheet uh, from uh, for each product. Um, if it is missing and you or you've had trouble getting a safety data sheet for something you think should have one, document your efforts to obtain one so that in the event that you know OSHA comes in or there's a complaint or whatever, you can prove that you've made done your due diligence to try to get a safety data sheet when your vendor is resisting giving you one. Um, you can't ask employees to do internet searches for your SDSs. In other words, uh, there's tons of SDSs on the internet. We know that we can, you know, go, we probably go there to get stuff ourselves. However, um, you can't say to the employee, "Hey, just go look this up on the internet. Go Google it and get the SDS." That cannot be serve as a substitute for you having a a a, a method for the employees to access that. Uh, employers have to maintain the most recently received version of the SDS. In other words, when a new one comes in, take the old one out, archive it, and replace it with the new one. Um, this is an interesting, this last bullet point, uh, I've seen this come up numerous times that, you know, you're buying, say, isopropyl alcohol for your core room from uh, vendor A, uh, but now purchasing says we're going to buy it from vendor B or we got, you know, there's a great deal on something, uh, but it's a different manufacturer, even though it may be the same isopropyl alcohol that you've always used. You cannot substitute one manufacturer's uh, safety data sheet for another. It has to match and has to be from that specific vendor. So I think that's something that there was a little confusion on in the past, but OSHA makes it pretty clear in their CPL that that expectation uh, now. Um, other elements to include in your written program about safety data sheets um, include designating who's responsible for getting them and maintaining the system, um, how and where you're going to store them, whether it's in three ring binders or some sort of electronic system. Uh, if you're using an electronic system like 3E or SDS Online or whoever, you need to have procedures on how to retrieve those documents electronically and have a backup system. Uh, and this has actually been OSHA's policy for a very long time. They have no problem with you using electronic systems, but if the power goes out or your uh, your computer goes out or whatever, you need to have another method of doing it. And, you know, in this day and age with, you know, less expensive tablets and, and laptops and different things, um, I think it's a lot easier to do this now where there is a backup uh, or if there's an emergency, you just take that along with you that you can access electronically your SDSs. Um, you also so again, have to te have uh, teach employees how to obtain SDSs if they're in electronic format. Uh, in your written program, you need to have the procedures that you're going to follow if the SDS isn't received. In other words, what are you going to do? How are you going to handle that material? Are you going to reject it? Or what it is, just you need to explain that. Uh, and who is going to uh, be responsible? Procedures to follow if you think the SDS is not appropriate and then uh, procedures to determine if your SDS is the most concurrent SDS that you have.
have on file. So these are things that the, that, um, the CPL outlines of stuff you have to have in your written program. Just a couple more things about SDSs before we uh, pop on to uh, labels. Um, SDSs have to be provided at each facility. So if you're, um, if you're a foundry that has multiple locations um, and you have one vendor that's supplying something to you at multiple locations, they have to send that SDS to each facility. It's not good enough to just send it to a corporate purchasing person. Uh, it has to be provided to each facility. Now, if you have an electronic management system, that's not to say that document just goes on the electronic system, but the, the shipper, uh, the, the manufacturer is obligated to provide it to each facility. It has, as I mentioned before, it has to be provided at the first shipment. There is no obligation to supply it with, with uh, subsequent uh, shipments. So it's really important when that document comes in the very first time that you have a way of, of getting that and getting it into your system. Uh, if you have retail, uh, commercial accounts at retail establishments, they have to provide you with an SDS. So that would be, you know, the Walmarts and the Home Depots of the world, and, and most of them do have SDSs available for their products. Um, the standard doesn't require manufacturers and importers to supply SDSs for non-hazardous chemicals. So even though you may want one or your employees may ask for one, if something truly is non-hazardous, uh, they don't have to prepare an SDS. Many of them do. Uh, but they are not obligated. I think the problem here uh, does come in, though, with some manufacturers calling their stuff non-hazardous. Uh, but as you read through the document, it's giving all these PPE and first aid recommendations and referencing exposure limits. But under uh, Section 2, they say there's nothing hazardous uh, of this. So I think you have to, you have to be careful about um, how they're defining that. But again, the obligation is they don't have to give you document if, if, it, if it's not necessary. Um, if you make any changes on an SDS, you become the responsible party. So my advice to you, uh, unless you want to become really good at classification, is don't alter any of the documents. Don't put your name on it. Don't put anything else on an SDS other than what you get from your, uh, from your vendor. Uh, if the classifications change on one of their products, they have to supply you with that new SDS within three months. So um, it, 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 there's, the expectation is that they quickly turn things around. And lastly, there is an expectation that you actually read these documents. Um, I know everybody's busy, and it's easy just to stack them in a pile and scan them all in one bunch and just have them there, and it becomes a big paperwork exercise. But Really, the whole point of hazard communication is to figure out what do we have to do to handle this stuff safely. And if you never read the documents, uh, you won't know that. And it's pretty clear from OSHA that, that they do expect you to read these so that you know what to do with the products. What do you do about old stuff? You know, you, you either have a vendor that's gone out of business or you haven't purchased anything after last year's um, uh, deadline uh, for revision of SDSs. Well, uh, the bottom line is you just maintain whatever the most recent S MSDS that you have. You're under no obligation to create an SDS. Um, but you need to let your employees know that there sometimes can be differences between MSDSs and SDSs. Uh, and for old stuff, they're only going to see the MSDS. And that doesn't mean that there's no hazard there. Electronic distribution, I'm not going to go through a lot of this. You can read it on your own. But this applies to uh, vendors of yours who may want to transmit all of their documents to you electronically. Um, OSHA has this, this process where you have to agree to opt into that form of transmission. They can't require you to purchase any software or any device to do that. Um, it has to be something that's free and readily available. Um, and um, they still have to provide a hard copy if you request that. So um, that may or may not apply to your situation. Access to SDSs. Employees must have unrestricted access to SDSs on all shifts at all times. Um, again, this is no change in OSHA's policy. It's always been that way. So look carefully at, at how employees access them, whether it's a three-ring binder or a computer system. They need to be able to get to it any time. Um, electronic systems, um, again, employees have to have adequate computer access without restrictions. In other words, if it's the second shift person but the computer's locked up in the first shift supervisor's office, that would not be considered um, 
acceptable. That would be a, a restricted access. So you need to make sure it's in an area where employees can always get access. Of course, they have to be trained in how to use the system. And employees can ask for and receive hard copies if they want them. Uh, if you have mobile workers out in the field, I uh, don't think that happens a lot with foundries, but it depends on what you're doing. You have to make sure that your written program addresses how employees in the field will gain access to uh, safety data sheets. Uh, some challenges, um, getting accurate and uh, up-to-date um, SDSs, be persistent and document your efforts to get them, um, keep them up-to-date. Um, I don't have a good, easy solution to that. It just is something you've got to slog through and do. Um, electronic vendors, don't depend on them to always keep your, your records up-to-date. Um, some of these systems, they go out on the Internet or go to vendors and, and populate their databases for you. I, you know, that's fine, but you, you still have the obligation to make sure that what they're giving you uh, is the most recent and is, the, is documents that, that are correct. Um, the stuff sneaking into your plant without an SDS, I think that becomes an education issue uh, directed at people most likely to bring stuff in, engineers, R&D, supervisors, maintenance, that the salesperson comes over and says, hey, I got this great stuff, let's try it. That's fine, but they need to give you an SDS if you're going to do that. So letting your folks know that that's the, uh, that's the requirement uh, is very important. Uh, or that your people in the shipping and receiving department know that they, uh, if they don't have an SDS, that they aren't, aren't to accept that material. So three, labeling. This will, we'll spend a little time on this because I think this is probably one of the most confusing areas here and um, more problematic, highly cited part of the standard. Um, and uh, a label has to be on the immediate container of every hazardous material, hazardous chemical. And your written program should include um, the elements that are listed there, who's going to do it, what systems you're going to use, how you're going to update labels, uh, particularly for implant systems, and uh, procedures for portable containers, how you're handling them. Uh, there's a requirement only to have these labels in English. If you want to put them in multiple languages, that's great but there is no obligation to do so. And they have to be prominently displayed. And I would add it would be nice to have them on the side of the container that the employees can actually read them. I see a lot of things like uh, large chemical containers, drums, and uh, you can see the drum, but you can't see the label because it's turned around facing the wall and you can't see it. Um, I find that really annoying because I always like to verify you know, what the stuff is, and it's hard to do that if the labels aren't uh, readily available to read. So let's talk about ship container labels. Uh, these are the things that need to go onto the label. Um, for those of you who've been working with GAH, uh, the, these 2012 revisions, uh, this is very straightforward. Uh, the key things here that I want to emphasize is that the name on the product identifier, again, has to match the SDS. Um, so that someone could go and look at it for further information. Uh, you should be aware that there may not be a signal word um, be, or a pictogram uh, because the classification does not require them. So, so if, you're, if they're missing, it may be because they, they don't have to be there because of the, the, the classification. Uh, for the manufacturer's name, there has to be a name and a physical address and phone number. Uh, web address isn't, uh, isn't sufficient. Um, OSHA talks a lot about the immediate container has to be labeled. By immediate, they're, they're talking about the, the, the stuff that, that people will, will see. Um, outside boxes and overpacks are often used for chemical shipments. Um, hazard communication doesn't require the labels on these unless the shipping container is also the immediate container. You know, I think your typical 55-gallon drum or the large totes of chemicals, they are the shipping container as well as the immediate container that the employee would be seeing. Um, if, there's, if there are containers within a box, then each immediate container within that box has to be labeled. Uh, sometimes you see the outer box labeled too, but um, the internal, the ones that the employee would be using also have to be labeled. Uh, there's a lot OSHA says about small, small containers. I'm not going to dwell on this because I don't see a lot of this in foundries, but um, little bottles, um, you can't fit all the stuff that's required on them. So, OSHA says, well, you still have to have the information. It has to go on that uh, shipping container. But employee, if you have these things there um, and, and there's not one of these fold-out labels like you oftentimes see on medications and stuff, uh, but there's only an outside label on the main box or the, the container there, employees have to know that they can go there for further information. So uh, if you have these situations, just be aware of that. Pictograms, uh, you can't have any blank pictograms. The pictograms cannot um, 
cannot be left, um, you can't use the words intentionally blank or no GHS pictogram. All of those things, you can't put an X through it. You can't do anything. The pictogram um, has to, has to if, if it's not there, it's not supposed to be on, on the label. And um, you can black it, black it out, because I know some of these um, labeling systems, they, they spit out all nine pictograms, and you either are supposed to circle them or put an X. That is not allowed. Uh, you have to only have the pictograms that are there. You could take a marker and, and fully black it out for the ones that don't apply. But if I was using that chemical, I'd be, and I was uh, wondering, you know, it, has it been defaced or what, what's, the, what's the problem here? Uh, but OSHA is very explicit that you can't have blank or X'd out pictogra pictograms on labels. Uh, containers purchased before a last year's June 1st deadline do not need to be relabeled with GHS labels. But this, those old labels should have met the 1994 requirements. And again, employees should know just because there's no GHS label on it doesn't mean they're not hazardous. Rails and tank cars, a um, couple of little exceptions there if you have these on your site. Uh, if they are the container, then, the, then you must have the OSHA HASCOM 2012 um, either posted on that or attached to the immediate shipping papers. A um, couple more things on labels. Um, the samples uh, that are taken within a facility that might contain hazardous materials have to have the HASCOM uh, labels on it, unless it's one of those portable containers for immediate use by the, uh, by the employee who did the transfer. Uh, again, the product name has to match. Um, and if you have things that are kits, you often see these with adhesives and stuff. Each uh, container has to be labeled. So let's talk about implant systems. I know this is the thing that really confuses people, and uh, folks have found this uh, kind of frustrating as to what is, what, what is OSHA actually looking for here. So you have two choices with implant labeling systems. And what we mean here is that your containers that are around your facility, whether they're portable containers going from person to person, shift to shift, or they may be stationary containers or whatever, uh, or perhaps chemical drums that come in. A lot of people in the old days used to have HMIS or NFPA, and they'd slap those labels on things. Well, under I think OSHA's gotten a lot more clear about their expectations of these uh, alternative labeling systems. So your choice is don't use alternative labeling systems. In other words, only use the ship label. Or if you do use an alternative labeling system, the expectation is that they per that 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 the employees can get further information that is immediately available uh, to the employees. Uh, the symbols that are used cannot contradict the pictograms or use the wrong symbol. And I think that's where some of the confusion comes in with these systems. Um, OSHA is really putting a burden on, on and the, the burden of proof is on the employer to, know, to demonstrate that employees actually get it. So I put some language in there about how OSHA looks at it. Um, In-house labels, if you are using those on portable containers and things, don't necessarily have to have a pictogram. They don't necessarily have to have the red border. And by, by saying that, I think you, if I, again, was the employee, I think if you drop these things from your implant labeling systems, consider how the employee is going to interpret that. If, if these things are missing and you've spent all this time training them on how important it is, I just think that creates a lot of confusion for the employee. So my vote is to always be consistent, even if the regulators don't require it. I'm not going to go through all of this. You can read this on your own later. But this is all stuff that OSHA said about these alternative labeling systems. And I think, I think the, the one that's bolded there is the most important labels have to contain the product identifier and general information regarding all of the hazards, even if these other systems are used. So uh, I think sometimes these systems are more pain in the butt than they're worth, but you know you have to determine that in your own facility. So HMIS uh, is still available. It's been revised again. Um, and what they did, um, there's a lot of confusion about how you take, a lot of vendors are no longer putting HMIS and NFPA information on their SDSs or their products. Um, but the, the way that classification and HMIS were, didn't work under the old system. So uh, they have this implementation manual so that you can compare GHS stuff with the HMIS classification thing. Um, you can purchase that for 299 bucks so that you can look up the GHS stuff and figure out what your HMIS ratings are. Um, I personally think this is 
a lot of rigmarole to go through. The, 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 what they're very clear about is you cannot use old HMIS labeled for GHS labeled products. In other words, they, the, the old system of HMIS did not, does not match up with the GHS system for labeling. Uh, NFPA labels, um, again, they may not be on documents anymore. You could do it yourself. You could go, if you still like NFPA labels, you can go to the sections of the, of the SDS and figure out what should go on it and compare it. There is a table that's available through NFPA. Uh, there's a nice quick card that explains uh, a little bit more about NFPA labels. So the last element here um, is training and informing employees. I think this is something that's, uh, again, hasn't really changed at all. OSHA expects you to train about the hazards and explain to employees how to use the info on SDSs and labels. Uh, they expect that you provide an opportunity for employees to ask questions and that the training be comprehensible. Um, you have, these are the required elements for the training. Obviously, the stuff about labels, um, stuff about SDSs, how to detect hazardous chemicals, um, where they are, what they should do if they're exposed, um, or what your, operate, what your PPE and other requirements are, uh, where to get the written program and the inventories, and the physical hazards and, and health hazards of the stuff that they're exposed to. Um, in your written program, you should include, include the following stuff, who's responsible for training, what format you're using, what you're covering in your training, and your procedures for how you're going to train at assignment and when new hazards are introduced. There is no obligation to do annual training, nor is there obligation um, to just train on, on, on old stuff all the time. It's really focusing on when you introduce a new hazard, that's when you're supposed to train. Now, there's nothing wrong with re refresher training, but it's not a requirement of the standard. Uh, be sure to include those downstream hazards uh, in your training programs if those apply. Um, OSHA is not expecting folks to be able to regurgitate toxicology and industrial hygiene. They're looking for do they have a general awareness of the hazards, do they know how to obtain and use SDSs and labels, do they know what to do if there's an emergency. So that's really what OSHA is looking for in, in the training. If you're using alternative labeling systems, make sure the employees understand those systems and what it means and where they can go to get further information. Uh, last topic here is multiple multi-employer work sites. Uh, go over just this real briefly. If you're using temp agencies or contract employees, you need to be very careful about specifying who's responsible for what. Um, OSHA will look at contracts to determine who is responsible, so make sure that you're addressing these in the contract and everybody's clear on who's doing what with hazard communication. Uh, they do subject to the last step to evaluate and assess your program. Uh, this is not required in the standard, but it's not a bad idea. Uh, these are the um, links to the documents that I referred to here. So um, you can access these uh, off of the OSHA website. And that's the presentation. So I'm going to click here and see if we've got any questions. Oh, boy. we got a lot of questions. Holy cow. I've got to figure out how to read this here. Hey, you can undock the questions, and it'll expand it into a window that's easier to read. Um, how do I? How do I? How do I do that? Um, do you see that little? Um, the it's right next to that X. Undock. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see. Got it. Okay. Let's go through these. Um, I got to get up to the top here. Uh, the first question is: have, Can you have your employees access the SDS through supervisors? Our supervisors have access to the system, but our leads do not. Is it okay to have it that way, or do I need to look at the system and change it? I would say that that is um, questionable. Um, if they have to go through and ask the supervisor, and the supervisor is not there, and there's no backup way to do that. Um, I suspect OSHA is going to look askance to that. Um, I, that. That's just my feeling. I think I've had a, one of the foundries that is one of my clients. Um, actually, they had their safety data sheets in a very large open office area, which also had supervisory offices around it. And they got cited for not uh, um, for having a barrier to access to the uh, SDS is simply because it was in a supervisor's office and they thought that might be intimidating. You know, I kind of think that's kind of a bogus thing, but nonetheless, that's, that's the approach. So 
I, I guess my advice is that I think you have to make it more accessible. That would just be my thing. Uh, the next one, have you seen SD, AFS's SDS's for cast iron products? Are they compliant in your opinion? Um, this is an ongoing discussion um, with AFS. Um, we are going to be looking at that um, because uh, up until recent, in, in, under the old um, hazard communication standard, um, there were less stringent requirements for um, downstream and byproduct hazards. Uh, when they came out with their CPL and with this newer document uh, this year, uh, it's becoming a little clear that, that, that there might have to be some revisions made in those SDSs. Uh, we will keep you in the loop about that. Fred, did you want to say anything else? Yes, Kay. At the time we put the SDSs together and you were part of that, they were approved by OSHA. Yeah, what they had told they what they had told us is that they were articles and did not need to be classified. Um, that appears they have appeared to have changed that approach, and so we are going to be looking at uh, first of all trying to get an interpretation from OSHA to make sure that's what they expect, and then uh, move forward on that. So you'll be kept in the loop. All the about information that. they need is in sections two and section eight of the SDSs. And if there's a change, if we have to go back and change and add uh, pictograms and hazard statements. Anybody that bought the old one will get it updated automatically. Okay, okay there you go. Thank you, Fred. Um, is it okay to have GHS compliant labels for hazardous chemicals and HMIS labels for non-hazardous chemicals as long as it's in the written plan? I, I would say that that would probably be okay as long as employees aren't confused by it. I'm trying to think of why you would want to put a HMIS label on a non-hazardous chemical since you're not required to do any labeling for non-hazardous chemicals. But I, I think if you can if you can justify it and you can explain it so the employees clearly understand the distinctions with it, uh, it's probably OK. Um, is it possible to get a copy of what's just discussed? Yes, AFS will be making this available for you. That's a couple of questions on that. Um, please restate what laboratories are not covered under the HASCOM standard. Um, you mentioned QC labs and production support labs. Uh, since those OSHA considers those offshoots of the production process, so any laboratory that is an offshoot of a production process uh, is considered to be covered under the standard. Um, the distinction with, with laboratories that I guess that I would look at is laboratories that are doing laboratory analysis for I know non-commercial, non-production reasons are the ones that are exempt. I, I'm trying to think of some other laboratories that you might be referring to here, uh, but if they have anything to do with the production process, they have to be covered under the standard. Uh, SDSs are needed for forklift batteries. Are they needed for the propane forklifts? This actually was uh, addressed in a letter of interpretation that OSHA has. Um, and the original propane container, I believe, has to have the, um, the 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 uh, 2012 compliant things on it. The issue came up with replacement propane tanks. Um, Fred, can I send you that interpretation letter, or can you send that out when um, you send out the electronic documents? Would that be okay? Yes, send send it to us, and then we'll attach it with the. Okay, I'd rather have OSHA explain this issue of propane tanks. I know this affects a lot of people, so it'll probably be useful for people. Okay. Um, we do water samples. Do we need to have those labeled with H hazard communication info? Um, I don't think so, unless there's some hazardous chemical within uh, that water sample. I suppose they, they might have some um, inhibitors. I'm not a I'm not a water sample expert. Um, my initial thing is that it, the answer is no, but I, that would be something I'd have to look at and see whether or not OSHA would consider that a problem or not because of the additives that might be there. Um, so, so the person who asked me that, if you want to send me an email, or Fred, again, is this something that I could just send to you and you can get it out to the participants? You can send it also with your other attachment. We'll attach everything that All right. you send. That one I don't have an answer for right away. Um, who provides labels on containers when they come in? Do we need to label them ourselves, or do vendors provide the labels on the containers? If that if that material is a hazardous substance and and is subject to the requirements of the standard, that manufacturer or distributor is obligated to put that label. You are under no obligation to add any additional labels. They should be doing that for you. Uh, and then the last one was about uh, the same thing about making it available. So I think I covered all the questions. Let me just check, check my chat thing to see if anybody's chatting with me.
uh, no. Um, so we're we're good. That's that's great. 